It's about improving the process by which you create attention, capture attention, and monetize attention. And so we can dive into talking about reverse engineering that process of creating attention, what you're doing, and what you could be doing differently. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 322. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. Today, we're going to be talking all about reverse engineering your music business growth and what three areas you can focus on and how to take a reverse engineering perspective on building up your business. With me, as always, is Erica. Eric, happy Tuesday, my friend. Happy Tuesday to you, friend. I'm excited to get into this topic because I think it's a helpful way to, to sort of shortcut all of the overwhelm and thinking that comes with trying to plan out how you're going to grow and get you over the hurdle of worrying about product, which I think I'm going to make a, maybe a little bit of an unpopular statement here, maybe a little bit controversial. I don't know, but I'm just going to say this. A lot of times in the music, the music business, music industry, music marketing space, you'll hear people talk about like, Hey, you just need to improve the product. You just need to improve the product. And they're so often they're talking about the the music itself, right? We did an episode about this like about a month ago where we were, we're talking about what do you do when you need to improve the music when it's not the marketing. This episode is kind of the opposite of that. And I want to sort of push against this idea of like, it's not always about looking at the product and being like, oh, I'm not growing because my music is just, the the product just isn't good enough. Because sometimes that time's not it. And it's an idea that holds artists back and gets them kind of stuck in this bind of like, I need to just grind to keep making my art better and better and better. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but if it stops you from doing and actually trying to get people to hear you, well, that sort of defeats the purpose of everything, in my opinion. Yeah, it's really tough because we see both ends of that spectrum. We see like, no, you really need to keep grinding on your on your art. And then we see like you have developed to a level where you are like sufficient to generate like market attention and you're just not doing that part. And there's all the evidence in the world to suggest that you can be really, really good and be obscure. So like just being world class at an art form doesn't guarantee you to be world, to give you world recognition. That's a really good point. I think that's actually a great sort of jumping off point here of like, there are probably more artists around the world, more musicians around the world that fall into that camp, you know, really talented, but obscure, never heard of, don't have any fans. There's a lot of really talented people in the world. Not everybody sucks, (laughs) you know? Although there are a lot of cases where people do Pasco, do collect $200 before having like you know, develop the music a lot. That does that probably happens at a greater clip. Just through the like the law of averages and Pareto distributions, it's probably more likely. <laughs> this is a balancing beam sort of topic for sure, which is why I wanted to talk about it today, or at least why I wanted to start out by talking about it like this. Because once we get this out of the way, the way and in the room where if you can critically take a look at your music and say, I'm happy with this and I feel like this has marketability and that there's people that would like this or maybe you have some fans that do dig it and they like what you're doing and they're in your world and that gives you cause to say, okay, I should pass go and start working on actually growing this thing and growing this fan base. What we can then get into talking about is like, all right, how do I reverse engineer that? And I think the first way to do that is, again, not by looking at improving the art itself or the process by which you create that art, which is a whole nother piece of the equation of like growing your business, which is like, how do I get more efficient at actually making music? It's not about that though. It's about improving the process by which you create attention, capture attention and monetize attention. And so we can dive into talking about reverse engineering that process of creating attention, what you're doing and what you could be doing. differently. That sounds like a good setup to me. Yeah. And you know what? I think like the interesting thing about this is that it starts very simply, like literally grab a piece of paper, put a line down the center, hold it vertically, put a line down the center. 
to the left of the line is the things that you're doing right now. And to the right are the things that you want to, could be, or are inspired to do. And for each of these umbrellas, creating, att- creating, capturing attention, monetizing attention, list out the things that you're doing, both ongoing, you know, processes, campaigns, stuff that's just happening in your music business and active things that you're doing, you know, things like engaging with your fans day to day, just as an example, make a list like that. So we can pick apart like in the creating attention stage, itemize out what's the things that are happening in your music business that help you help attention. What does your posting cadence look like? How are you creating videos? What do they look like? The content around your music, what does that look like? How are those videos gathering new fans? How are people discovering you? What's happening? This is one of the things th- that we do in our audit process at the agency is not only are we taking stock of like what audiences look like, but we're also looking to see, well, how do people move through stages, these three stages? How are fans moving through them? What's facilitating that kind of movement? And so that is sort of the critical analysis that we're doing here is what are you doing right now, right? What's going on in your music business right now? And then we can talk about what you might want to do, could do, or inspired to do. Yeah, I think quite often, right? If we're dealing with someone who's like probably in those beginning stages of like hasn't really created attention yet, the list of things they're currently doing is very small. And the list of things they could do can often be overwhelming. It's a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. And so it can be helpful to identify not what you could do, not what you might want to do, but rather that which is most feasible to do reliably across long time frames. So that's why, like, for instance, when people talk about posting cadence, I always say, like, the most that you can keep up for a year and not collapse, right? So ideally, you're posting every day. But if that's not feasible for you, I would rather you post three times a week for two years than post every day for, you know, two months. So I I think you should really try to condition yourself to be honest with like, what can you keep up and start small so that you don't bump up against that limit too quickly or, you know, overshoot it and then have like an unsustainable process. Yeah, that's a really good point. And honestly, I think that same rule applies a step further if we start talking about things like running ads on your content to get new fans. If you're thinking about it in the same vein, think about, okay, starting out here, maybe you give yourself a ramp where it's like, I know I can comfortably spend X number of dollars. I know I can budget X for the next three months. I know after that, I should be able to budget Y. You can start to set levels for yourself that you can attack things with, both with effort, which is what you were talking about, Sir, like posting cadence, like I'm going to stick to this plan because I know I can do it over a year. When it comes to budget, it's like, okay, I know that I can stick to this plan because it's within my budget. I was, I've been having conversations with artists just over the last couple of weeks. And in quite a few of them, the topic of budgeting and, and funding came up. And what's always interesting to me and, and a little funny, not at their expense in any way, but when budgeting comes up, it's like, oh, oh, well, what do you need? Like, what are you, what are you trying to shoot for? And it's like, well, I don't really know. And it's like, well, you can't base a budget on something that you don't really know. So assign a number. <laughs> I think that that's, while it's challenging, maybe to look at your business finances and your personal finances, wherever you might be investing money from, you kind of have to take that look. And this is what allows you to plan. And again, like this, the whole topic of this episode is like reverse engineering. So I think it's helpful to think a little bit beyond just like, okay, for the next month, I'm going to spend five bucks a day or 10 bucks a day or whatever it might be. Think longer term and sure things might happen, but because financially things might be a bit more volatile than just like a posting cadence, for example, or an engagement cadence, but you can at least set somewhat of a realistic plan for yourself. Yeah. I think also like there's a reason that we talk about content and then ads for like this getting attention part, the early part of your career. It's because there are alternatives. There's PR There is playlisting and focusing entirely on streaming. There is collaborating with larger artists to get more attention. There's a lot of different ways to get exposure. You'll notice that all the ones I mentioned as alternatives either are very costly or have a low likelihood of return or both. So like PR, streaming, you just have no access to the data or communication with those fans. 
So even if you do get exposed to lots of people and they really like it, there's really not much you can do thereafter. I mean, you have to really hope that they not just stream you, which probably won't make up for the cost of, of getting in front of them in the first place, at least not anytime soon, but that they also then go and, and make larger purchases, tickets, albums, merch, digital memberships, any way that like them being a fan of you subsidizes the cost of exposing your music to them. So content happens to happen on social media and all of these platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, they all monetize through advertising, which is why by default, they give you lots of access to communicate with the people who become fans of you because they want you to advertise to them. They want you to create commerce on the platform. So they often give you really robust control of your data and your fan base. You can really communicate with these people. So that's why content and content, you know, these days, the most successful content is often recorded for no budget, right? It's mo most often created on a smartphone you already had with stuff that's lying around, right? Or in public places. So it just happens to be the lowest cost, highest likelihood of return method for getting attention, which is why we tend to converge on it. So in terms of like things you could be doing, like for me, it's not so much about content or this other thing. It's more about like what volume of content can you pull off for sustainably? Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. And here's a, I think an easy framework for talking about content, why it comes first and why it very easily slates into that right side of that list that I was talking about, right? When I mentioned, like, think about the things that you could do, want to do, or inspire you, inspiration for content is all over the place. It's very easy to find artists that you dig the vibe that they're putting out. You're probably a music fan yourself. And you're like, oh, I can take inspiration from this. This kind of fits kind of who I am as an artist as well. as well. I can make stuff like this. I'm inspired now. I'm going from a place of like, I didn't want to do this on the left side of the page to, I really dig this. Like, here's 10 artists that have made stuff that I really like. And if I just model the style, put my own spin on it, put my music around it, put it in a me looking wrapper, then you've got all of a sudden fuel to not only create content that, like you said, Cirque, has uh, a low cost and a high likelihood of actually getting you fans. But also, if you're inspired to do it, the likelihood of you actually doing the work, work goes way up because it's something that you dig. Yeah, 100%. So I think that that's a really good way to think about reverse engineering attention, the creation of attention. If you think about your content, you think about the stuff that inspires you, and you start to make stuff that models that we've talked about this before yeah like literally we did a whole episode where it starts off with like look at successful models in your genre and style and reverse engineer like content recommendations for yourself right so it's to right on brand <laughs> right exactly exactly and then once you start doing that then you can build in the advertising if you want to if you want to budget if you can budget once you start to get traction then you can plug in paid traffic to that. And that's kind of the next step. This is again, like looking at the things you are doing is you probably don't have a system for taking the content that's doing well and amplifying it and paid traffic can do that for you. So that's an easy way to reverse engineer the creation of attention. Super easy. You just need the content to be the, the fuel for the fire, so to speak. 100%. So that's just like the first umbrella of these three. And then we're talking, you know, the next question that you ask yourself again is like not talking about going and trying to improve the process by which we create music or the product necessarily. We're looking at the the growth levers. The next one being, how do I improve the way that I get that your attention, right? How do you get more fans to go from the stage where they know who you are, they've heard some of your music, they hang around you, Maybe they're engaging with you on social media. How do you start to become a bit more more present with them? What does that look like? What does it look like to take them to the next stage? And we talked recently on the show about all sorts of different tools to do that. We talked about the indie CRM. We talked about email autoresponders like Drip. We talked about email 
marketing in particular, we talked about bribes and different types of free offers you can use to get your fans off the fence and kind of taking a next step with you so that they're communicating with you. We'll make sure to link to those episodes in the show notes. Actually, they would be, a, I think, a helpful review. But I think the biggest thing here when we talk about reverse engineering is that most artists in their growth systems, I think, are actually actually very lopsided in a lot of ways. Is there's a whole bunch of emphasis on like creating attention, creating attention, and not a whole lot of emphasis on capturing and monetizing in many, many circumstances. And so if you find yourself in a place where you've kind of got nothing going on, attention, the way I would... to reverse engineer from out there in the marketplace. But yeah, you could definitely reverse engineer. You, you could take a component of your own construction and reverse engineer back from there. So it's like, what do I want to achieve with this capturing attention, right? You ideally want a way to communicate with your fans that is very personal, that is highly customizable, and that has no rate limiting, right? That's not going to like, like for instance, like on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, right? Like, you are rate limited in terms of your reach. You could have 50,000 followers and you might only be able to reach, you know, 20% of them with a given post. And you don't decide which of the, of the fans you actually reach, right? The algorithm decides that. If you want to make an offer exclusively to your fans and not to any cold audience, can't do that on social either. That's what we call earned media, right? Like in a sense, you earned it. Because you created content that caused them to follow you, but you don't own it. And so you really want to convert all that to, to own media. The mechanism you use to do that is offers. It's like you can't force people to come into a, you know, a private communication channel or give you a way to contact them personally. You have to coax them. It has to be their decision. It's completely, you know, volitional. So offers are the mechanism that's all about offers at that point. What's going to entice someone to come off the fence? And one way to reverse engineer it would be to take a sample, right? Instead of doing it at scale, let's find a really fervent fan in your comments, someone who clearly is following you, try out different offers on them in a DM, right? Say like, if I were going to give you this, would you sign up for my email list? And then you can ease back from there. You can go to less warm fans, people who follow you, but maybe aren't always in your comments and DMs. And you can try out offers on them and try to find something that captures the broadest range of like fan types uh, from organic social with one-to-one -one communication. And then once you've got that like working toy model, this offer, lots of people say they would sign up for this. Okay, great. Now let's scale it up. Yeah, dude, I really like that approach. It's like the raise your hand approach almost, you know, like you're communicating with somebody. And I see businesses actually do this a lot outside of music where they'll be like, hey, shoot me a yes or like hit my DMs if you'd be interested in XYZ thing that I'm thinking about giving out. And they use that. That's like a social post example, but you can do the same thing in a direct message with a fan or a potential customer or whatever and just say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. If I asked you to sign up for my email list for you to get it, would that be cool? Would you like that? Would you be willing to do that? And I, I, think, I think you're right. That's a really good way to reverse engineer people's interest around different things. And our, I think, you know, I experience artists who have done that er, very early stages, especially in hip hop. Like a lot of like hip hop and rap artists that we worked with over the years, they built early on these very tight knit, die hard communities of fans. And I would see like, because we see the back end of so many Instagram accounts and Facebook pages and whatnot over the years, I would see like real conversations that these people were having with fans that were like their OG day one type fans. 
they would do exactly that where they would ask them like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this or I'm thinking about giving this away, or I'm thinking about hosting my fans in, in this kind of online experience or doing a live stream or a zoom hang or whatever. And it's kind of like that early adopter, a sort of access that you give to a fan that allows you to pick their brain, you know? Yeah. This is actually how I started entrepreneur. This method is it was for monetizing attention, not not capturing it necessarily, but the same thing applies. It's because it's offers and it's willing participants accepting offers, right? So when Entrepreneur started, I had already been working with a few artists and had constructed different ways I can provide value. I then had personal conversations with other artists who were like, can you do it for me? And I was like, not really. Like, I cannot do this for much more than the artists I'm working with right now. What I can do is teach you how to do it. And then I use personal conversations with artists who are asking for me to help them to determine what could I teach you out of all the things I know that would be worth what price. And that's how we got the first iteration of kind of our flagship training, FanFinder method. And that scaled up to tens of thousands of customers, starting from that initial point of you know, hand to hand combat, like working out with someone who wanted that, you know, what would they pay for it? What do they want? Yeah, that's super good and really interesting because I don't think I knew that. I don't think I knew that it started in the DMs in so many ways. I mean, obviously. Yeah, I've, I personally sold like, I think five or five to 10 seats for like a live run through a fan finder method, recorded it, and that became the train, the first iteration of the training. That's wild. That's a really good example. And actually, it transitions us per- perfectly into talking about monetization and monetizing attention. And what's really interesting here is going off that same point of view, Cirque, that you just mentioned about how Indopreneur's first customers came to be. You were having one-to-one conversations with these people. And if you're an artist and you're thinking about, okay, how can I reverse engineer monetizing my fan base? If you've got a list then you've got people you can talk to. And some of the best ways, I think, to start reverse engineering monetization is by, one, you just you have to just start making offers. Like, I'm going to just put that out there. It's like, you have to just start making offers. But a really great one to make for the very first time, especially if you've never sold anything online, is reach out to your fans that are on your email list and offer them something either at a very low cost that's like very hard to say no to or for free and they just cover like the shipping to their house. And doing that like in a nine word email style and we've talked about nine word emails before on the show, but in case you need a refresher, a nine word email is a a concept in direct response digital marketing where you're typically sending out an email that's it's pretty much one sentence. It might say, Kyle, as the subject line and the copy for the email would be, would you like a copy of my latest record for free? Just reply yes. And I'll ask you where to send it. And that's a nine word email. It's not fancy. It doesn't have a lot of graphics, but it it starts to gather a sense for you of what your fans are interested in. And honestly, you can use nine word emails all over the place in your music marketing, especially as you grow. But when it comes to starting the process of monetizing for the first time, it's a really good place to start. And again, you don't have to use a free plus shipping and handling funnel necessarily to do it. You could launch offers in the, in the exact same way. You know, if you're, if you've got a record that you've been working on, you could send out an email to sort of your diehard fans, or you could get in the DMs with them just the same way that Cirque was talking about and being like, Hey, I usually don't press physical copies of my records. I've got this album coming out and I was thinking about pressing, you know, 20 copies just as a test press. Would you be interested in having one and calling it your own? That would be a really easy way to start monetizing and getting a feel for whether your fans are into what you might be offering. Yeah, I think there's two really obvious cases that jump out at me for like monetization done well at a low level, then scaled. And the first is like all the people in our community who have scaled free plus shipping and handling. 
clearly they've figured out a way if we break down monetizing attention into subcategories, one of which is creating customers. So getting people to go from, I've never bought something from you to I bought. And then the second category being maximizing the value of each customer. So repeat purchases, how many? Just the part about creating customers, scaling free plus shipping and handling to the, to, you know, thousands, tens of thousands is creating customers at scale. Step one. And then the other one is, is maximizing the value of those customers once you got them. But that's just to say that like started as a toy model in most cases, take your warmest fans, your existing email subscribers and say, would you like a free record? Right. It's the easiest offer to take where they're, they still have to enter a credit card number to like claim it. Right. But they're really not giving you much money. <laughs> and then that opens the door and then repeat purchases are immediately thereafter in the funnel. So that kind of walks you through all those steps really well, but it starts with like warm audience because you don't know if the offer is going to work or if you're like landing page or your checkout funnel is like all set up right. So it, it, the least harm can be done by starting at that small level with a toy model. Once you've confirmed it works, we have people who have taken it to cold audiences through ads and scaled it up to thousands. So that's one obvious example of people who have been able to do that. The other obvious example is people like, and there's not so many like him, Andy Hunter, who has done that, but really started with touring and mostly cold audiences. So he monetized attention at the outset. He created attention with great videos, captured it with custom audiences and monetized it with ticket purchases, kind of all in one go, you know, in the same day. And he did that at scale for years repeatedly and still does it. And so that's an example of someone who has sort of, I guess it's forwards engineering it instead of reverse engineering it, but starting with a toy model and then scaling up. Because if something works at that low level, if you can get 10 people to buy something, chances are you can get 10,000. So making it work at that sample level and then figuring out scaling challenges as you go. You know, this is another really good example. I, I can think of an artist who ran an album launch and they weren't previously doing really any sales online. Now, granted, like this was an artist who had fans for sure. They had created attention and they had an email list and they had fans that they really considered like their diehards, like their people. And they ran an album launch and they used our ultimate album launch funnel and the whole format that comes along with running a launch like that. But before they made it live to all of their fans, they actually asked like some of their what I'll call like their inner circle fans to go through it first. And that got those fans exposure to the record first and foremost, which was really cool for them. And it got them exposure to the sales offer, which is the monetization piece here. And what was cool about that was like all of those people were really excited. So again, going to this toy model that you were talking about, sir, because like they identified a segment of people that were, they were like, these are people that are probably going to love this. If they hate it, then we know that everybody else is probably going to hate it. So we shouldn't use it then. And if they love it, then that's a good sign that there's probably other people in our world like them that are also going to love it. So again, it's another opportunity. And it's an opportunity to do something cool, like cool and not something you would do for every single person in your fan base. I think they let 50 people in initially. And all of the outreach about it was hand-to-hand, -hand, which was cool. It works. <laughs> and I think we didn't talk too much about this. And it's hard to talk about reverse engineering this process of repeat monetization. But just to touch on it quickly is like automation in a lot of ways is one step to continuing the monetization arm of your music business. After people go a number of days without purchasing again from your store, you follow up with them with reminder emails and offers and you hit them back. But also you start to build in a calendar of sales promotions. So whether that be adding on to your existing products and making new offers, say for example, you've got a record and at Christmas time, you decide to pair it with a holiday card around the holidays. And you make that offer to people who have never picked up the record from you before. 
that's a sales promotion or that's an offer that could go into a sales promotion and you can reuse or reskin the products that you already have into new offers without doing things like discounting. Now you also could do discounts. Absolutely. That's something that you can build into a cadence. What I'm getting at here is automation is part number one of repeat monetization of attention. And part number two is, I would say like consistency or calendar, the two C's. And you build into that and you find a frequency, a cadence that you like to do that at. And once you do that, you can say to yourself, oh, and I do this with a lot of clients actually, like we find a cadence that we're comfortable testing with their fans to be like, okay, we're going to try over the next three months, like we're going to run two sales promotions and see how it goes, see how people take to it. And if they take to it well, then we say, okay, in the next quarter, like we're going to do a monthly and see how they take to that. See if we start getting fatigue or pushback or our conversion rate goes down. Are the offers going to start to fatigue? Where do we introduce new products? All of that kind of stuff. Over years, we have clients that do monthly sales promotions and also fit in a flash sale to certain segments of their audiences at the top of the month. I'm in the middle of building one right now, actually, for Memorial Day, a full sales promotion for Memorial Day. And at the beginning of May, it's a flash sale that's just going to go for two days. So you start to build out you know, this kind of consistency and cadence, and you can do that all year round. So that's kind of the way that I like to reverse engineer the promotional process is you figure out what level of sales messaging your market can take, and then you build upon it from there, or you subtract if you need to, and that's okay. Yeah. If we're using the criteria of reverse engineering to arrive at like these methods and these strategies, look at Taylor Swift, right? She, she released an album that probably had seven to eight different iterations to it that presented new buying opportunities for her fans. Then she put out a tour that had like six different iterations where she used different sets. So same tour, but she's like doing different songs in different legs of the tour and has different like uh, set design pieces and, and all this stuff. And then tour concert films, right? Where she took, key shows from that tour released a film but then released other iterations of the film with different songs and different performances and each of them cost right so like she's taking one big release and iterating it which is effectively like a promotion of sorts because she's just including small differences that you can claim so She's really maximizing the value of her customers. I would say in a way that like feels kind of icky to me just because like, I don't like intentionally withholding value to then later reintroduce it, but not as a separate piece you can buy. You have to buy the whole thing plus this extra piece. So it has that same cost as something you already bought. I don't like that necessarily, but you know, it's a masterclass in like, maximizing the value you can extract from a release or a big tent pole thing, right? And then maximizing the value of customers through not only releasing those tent pole things, but then iterating them in ways that like some of her fans feel like they have to have every version. Yeah, that's such a good example. A masterclass in customer lifetime value. It's true. I've been very impressed over Taylor Swift's especially monetization over the last couple album cycles that she's had. I've been very, very impressed by them. I think it's, it's powerful. And obviously like some people, some people might define you, like you said, but I think what's cool about it is you can learn to adopt similar frameworks and concepts at a smaller scale if you want to. And I think that's, what's really cool about it is like, you can be like, oh, I really dig what she's doing there. I don't think I would want to do it at that level. Like that feels like too much for me. Feels like my fans wouldn't dig that. But like I could dial it back two notches and all of a sudden I've got something that, you know, really resonates and I can put together offers that are really cool. And this is another kind of going full circle here when we talked about reverse engineering the creation of attention and we talked about modeling artists that you dig. This is the kind of thing where if you can look critically at offers that are floating around, not just in music, but really anywhere, take, bit, take bits in from them and figure out 
how to construct offers in a way that feels cool to you, you can get a lot. I think you can get actually a lot of inspiration. It doesn't always come from the music industry. I'll say that. Like you've got anti-inspiration, which is like, they just dropped their record last night and didn't tell anybody like, don't pay attention to that. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Taylor Swifts where like there's stuff to pay attention to or like the ICPs uh, (laughs) where you can really follow what's going on. We'll have to link back to our episode with Seamus from Downright Merch where we talked a lot about artists and merchandising and we kind of pointed to examples like Taylor Swift because that's just one chief example that's, I think, top of mind for everyone in the world right now. But there's so many out there. Yeah, I mean, the first time what Taylor Swift did with the different cover jackets and booklets for the same record, ICP did that like 20 years ago. (laughs) So, yeah, definitely. They're also a master class in this. (laughs) Yeah, super cool. Well, this was fun, man. And I, I hope that this helps give you guys a bit of a sense of how you can think differently about growing your music career in these three kind of really important areas, you know, the creation of attention, the capturing of attention and the monetization of attention. If you can start to reverse engineer it, like we've been talking about it in, in this episode, you'll find yourself in a place where you're not so hung up in the details or paralyzed by all of the things you need to do. It gives, it can hopefully give you a little bit of a roadmap of, of where to attack for each level depending on what you've already got going on. Yeah. So with that, it's time to get at it, Indies. Go be engineers today. Go be engineers. (laughs) Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for joining us on Creative Juice. If you dug this episode, drop us a review. Let me and Cirque know what you think. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys next time. Peace.